Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our NASA Alumni League First Thursday program for today, uh, April 7th, 2022. I'm Stokes McMillan. Today, our speaker is Mr. Callum Hardy, uh, speaking to us live from London. So Callum was born in Milton Keynes, England, and he undertook his undergraduate degree in history in 2018. His studies focused on gaining a broad understanding of world history with a general focus on American history. Now his uh, dissertation focused on the causes and consequences of the Apollo 1 tragedy, where he worked with a number of uh, fellow alumni league members. And currently he's undertaking his postgraduate master's degree at King's College in London where his research focuses on the confidentiality and secrecy at NASA and the impact this had on safety during the Apollo program. And that's the subject of today's talk. So uh, he hopes to finish his postgraduate dissertation uh, and finish it uh, by uh, September of this year. And so Callum Hardy, let me turn the program over to you. Thank you, and I'd just like to say um, good afternoon to everyone and hope everyone's doing well. I'm just going to uh, put my uh, presentation up here. So the title of my presentation today is called Safety and Secrecy at NASA During the Apollo Program. I'm just going to uh, speak a little bit about myself and how I came to uh, focus on this topic and I'm going to talk about um, my dissertation and it's split into three different chapters and I'll go through that but um, I'll just start on here. So I have not long finished my undergraduate degree at uh, University of Reading where I achieved a first class in history and I'm now undertaking a master's degree in world history and cultures at King's College London. As you can see from the picture on the right hand side there, uh, that is the Apollo 10 command module that we have at the Science Museum. And I'm proud to say that I'm a mu uh, museum ambassador and tour guide uh, at the Science Museum. And we have a fantastic uh, space and science uh, exhibition, a permanent display. And I've been at the museum for about three years now, three, four years, uh, taking people on tours around all of our collections and it's really exciting and one of the main ways that got me into the interest of uh, space and NASA and especially with the fact that we have the actual Apollo 10 command module there um, is just an amazing uh, exhibition to have and you can really see how interested people can get in space looking at uh, artifacts such as that and we also have more recently Tim Peake's Sawyer's uh, descent module and you can see some more of the displays in the background uh, which is a really exciting place to go. And if you are ever in London, do come by to the Science Museum and uh, do feel free to contact me and uh, I'll be more than happy to show you around. So let's get started on this. So my investigation uh, originally started on trying to find the uh, causes of the Apollo 1 uh, fire. And that has been done quite a few times before and I decided to take sort of a, a different uh, aspect of the investigation and sort of look at how safety could have been improved with both hindsight and uh, future proofing human space flight um, missions and testing facilities so that they can be designed to be as safe as possible. And with the history that we've had with the shuttle missions and Apollo, I thought it was really important to get to um, the basics with the first significant uh, incident and the first and uh, unfortunately not the only loss of life uh, in NASA's uh, stint uh, in the pursuit of space. So my dissertation is titled Lessons Not Learned, the Apollo 1 Fire and the Mission to the Moon. And it's split into three different sections and I'm going to follow uh, each one through this uh, talk with you. The first one is the foundations of the fire, um, where I'll be looking at uh, the history of what happened and similar incidents before 
the fire on the 27th of January 1967. And then I'll be moving on to the internal investigations by Apollo, which is the Apollo 204 Review Board. And then my final chapter will be looking at the uh, external affairs, which involves the public and Congress. And as you can see on the uh, slide there, uh, that is the Apollo 11 crew, uh, Roger Chaffee, Ed White and Gus Grissom. And I think an important aspect to remember is what they achieved Unfortunately, uh, in their fate, it was the significant focus on safety and the human aspect of flight and aviation as a whole, and predominantly uh, the importance of reviewing safety information. However, as some of my researchers suggested, it didn't go too far in all areas, and it was a long, hard push to improve safety uh, even into the shuttle missions and beyond. So I'm hoping that as a result of this research, I'll be able to push forward um, and in uh, cases such as Artemis and the new missions that there is a really good focus on uh, the human aspect of safety and a look away from sort of hardware and software issues um, and how they integrate with uh, human performance and safety. So if I move on to the next slide. Um, I'm going to first talk about how did the Apollo missions come along because it's a really interesting talk and a lot of people be personally involved and some of the people I've spoken to, Sputnik was the number one place which really pushed them towards the um, space industry and engineering and aerospace engineering as a whole. So the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1 in 1957 and it was really a huge concern for many Americans. Um, and for most of the world as a whole, with the um, idea that the Soviet Union were capable of launching an unknown satellite with unknown potentials at that time above anywhere in the world, potentially taking pictures and gaining an unparalleled insight into uh, the space industry before the Americans had the opportunity to do so. And it was really a sign of things to come with the Soviet successes that began along with the introduction of animals going into space and people and the, their technological advancements. The uh, United States was lagging behind quite significantly until the push in uh, 1961 um, to really focus efforts on putting the man on the moon. The, uh, we'll just move on to the next slide here. There's a lot of historiography around um, the start of NASA, and a lot of it began with uh, President Eisenhower and what was deemed a mismanaged response to Sputnik. Eisenhower is believed to um, fail to quiet the fears of the American people, as uh, argued by Robert Devine, a great uh, diplomatic historian. And there was a, a significant perception that the technological and military achievements in the Soviet Union had uh, risen to quite significant lengths and more importantly they were believed to be higher than that of the United States which was a great concern for many people uh, particularly those that were in um, their early college educations. I was speaking to a few people that completely changed what course they were on in able to help the effort to increase um, aerospace and technological abilities for the United States government and for military achievements in the shadow of the Soviet Union and the risk that um, was believed to be posed and potentially uh, would have posed um, if there wasn't such a push by the United States. So I'm just going to move on to the next one. And the formation of NASA is uh, quite interesting as um, it was introduced in 1958, the National Aeronautics and Space Act. And uh, it meant that this new NASA absorbed the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics with 8,000 employees and a $100 million budget, which is obviously not much compared to the cost of the Apollo each year. Um, and it's quite interesting how the um, program uh, began as a orderly series of steps exploring space, which was what Eisenhower wanted. And that's why he appointed uh, Keith Glennon as the first administrator 
to avoid an uh, unrestrained space race. And it's also quite interesting as um, President JFK was also opposed to any sort of space race and space endeavors. Uh, the main reason was he didn't want to lose or believe that the risk of losing an American citizen in space was worth it. And it was also very concerned with the mounting costs that are related to space, which is obviously quite a significant factor. And during the Cold War, finances um, were difficult to manage with lots of different avenues of technology being invested in. What changed Kennedy's uh, mind, however, was um, multiple uh, Soviet achievements. Um, and the most important one was Gagarin's flight, uh, which was five days prior to Kennedy's failed Bay of Pigs invasion, which was 17th of April, uh, 1961. And this led to Kennedy wanting to find an avenue which he could confidently uh, defeat the Soviet Union in. A month later, Kennedy asked uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, do we have a chance of beating the Soviets by putting a laboratory in space or by a rocket to go to the moon and back with a man? And then on the 25th of May, Kennedy proclaimed at Capitol Hill that the nation must commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of a man landing on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. And that's how the Apollo program began. And uh, recently I watched a, a, a great clip from your 50th anniversary uh, memorial in Washington, DC. And um, it's about 20 minutes long and it's a great, uh, it's the Kennedy speeches uh, um, in Texas where he uh, proclaims the Apollo program is underway. Um, and it's a fantastic one for uh, people to watch. It's about 20, 25 minutes long, but it's definitely worth watching. So my uh, title is a reference to one of your members, Gary Johnson's work um, from the Johnson Space Center and Safety and Mission Assurance uh, Flight Safety Office. And his title is Lessons Learned from 50 Plus Years in Human Space Flight and Safety. And I can only thank the um, National Alumni League uh, for um, helping me find people to interview and documents to create and different organizations to work with as well as part of this research, which is lessons not learned, the Apollo 1 fire and the missions to the moon. Uh, what Johnson's work does is highlight problems he encountered on his whole career. So everything from Apollo, Skylab, all the way through to the uh, space shuttles. And, um, areas where there was breaches in safety and uh, shortcomings which he encountered within human space flight operations. And I also think it's necessary to explore these even further and understand the experiences of as many different NASA and Apollo staff as possible, or even contractors and engineers, officials, astronauts, everyone involved. Um, and one thing that I find with um, the research was the um, aspect that engineers hadn't been consulted as much as I had previously anticipated or expected. And it was really nice to incorporate different people who don't normally get the opportunity to um, show what their job involved and explain the amazing um, results of their work, which is important to remember that in, within the decade, the um, uh, the objectives were met and a fantastic achievement that is unparalleled in probably anything that's ever done in human history and especially world history. And the impact that the uh, Apollo 11 mission had on the world is something that hasn't been seen since. So uh, it's an exciting area to um, investigate and follow on to. I'm just going to uh, move on to explain what the research questions were for this uh, dissertation. Um, the first one was what role did previous high pressure uh, oxygen atmosphere incidents play in the build up to Apollo on fire? And that's uh, looking at the, uh, there was three to four significant accidents that all involved high pressure oxygen um, that led to either the injuries or uh, long-term health conditions of the crew that worked on them. And I'll explain that a lot uh, later on. 
The second question is, in what ways did the Apollo investigation highlight flaws in NASA safety, which was fundamental to a lot of my argument and the conclusions that um, I build? And the final uh, question is, what uh, was NASA's response to safety culture following the Apollo 1 fire sufficient to eliminate similar incidents thereafter? And my postgraduate uh, dissertation really follows on from this, looking at um, the role of confidentiality in particular in the role of safety at NASA. And that mainly applied to um, Apollo 8, 10 and 11, which I'll talk about later on. So this is uh, the first chapter that I'll talk about in this pure oxygen. Uh, you can see there's the crew on the left and the uh, command module on the right after it caught fire on the 27th of January 1967. And that was on pad 34, I believe, in, um, in Florida. And uh, you can see there's obviously substantial damage and this is where the investigation begins, focusing on pure oxygen. So in a quite harrowing way, um, a significant aspect of the um, trajectory of the Apollo program uh, was changed. And the horrific irony of the uh, Apollo 1 fire is that the escapability of the command module was a result of Gus Grissom's 1961 near catastrophe in his Mercury Redstone 4 Liberty Bell 7 capsule incident. After landing, uh, Grissom uh, followed the pin removal procedures for his hatch cover. And following from this, um, the explosive egress hatch covering uh, unexpectedly blew off. And this meant that water was being taken on board and the capsule began to sink. Gruss unfortunately was uh, able to escape, but um, the Liberty Bell 7 wasn't as successful and it sunk three miles below the seafloor, as you can see in the picture on the left there, and uh, Grissom before he got onto the Liberty Bell 7 on the right. Um, it was the first capsule to have um, an, uh, an opening that was done by explosive bolts and this was a big achievement um, and it meant that there was a very fast um, accessibility from inside and outside uh, in case of emergency and it was quite a pivotal um, invention and addition to the uh, uh, Liberty Bell 7 capsule if I uh, show you on the next one. Both the Mercury and Gemini missions had also operated with a pure oxygen uh, atmosphere system um, previous Mercury flights had indicated that pure oxygen was necessary. Um, this is uh, the alternative with the dual oxygen nitrogen atmosphere, uh, and therefore it was quite an easy uh, uh, implementation for Apollo to also go for the pure oxygen environment. The, uh, the problem is, as with uh, the Gus Grissom incident, a common theme was that the final conclusions of, of accidents were never completely known. And the issue with the Apollo program having such a tight deadline was that it didn't leave resources and time available for things to be um, understood and investigated to the level that was potentially most necessary. Um, for example, with the um, Gus Grissom incident, it wasn't known um, uh, what caused the explosive bolts to fire early. Uh, it was suggested that there was an exterior lanyard which is used to open the hatch and become tangled. Um, and there was another idea that the ring seal might have emitted on the detonation plunger and that there was another one that suggested static electricity created from the recovery helicopters had caused the hatch to detonate. Um, and as a result of that, the two-stage command module hatch um, pyrotechnics were removed. Uh, this significantly slowed down uh, accessibility in and out of the uh, command module and that had a pivotal impact on the Apollo 1 crew. Uh, I'm going to follow on to looking at the precursors of the uh, incident and um, these are the two major um, pure oxygen related um, incidents which should have uh, been telling for the Apollo crew of what could happen and um, 
I'll begin with on the 9th of September 1962, which is over five years before uh, the uh, Apollo 1 tragedy. There was a 14-day um, altitude chamber test at uh, Brooks Air Force Base. And uh, in the chamber, which was in a pure oxygen state, the fire erupted with no immediate cause. There was two airmen within the chamber, Captain Cole Fletcher and Henry Hall. And they were only able to break out um, due to uh, Henry Hall being um, uninjured uh, in the uh, incident, which was caused by a psycho uh, motor uh, used to measure crew performance. And it malfunctioned, igniting a flash fire. Uh, to add on to that, there was a foam type insulation that was placed just above the cooling lines, which ignited, producing a toxic, uh, toxic gas. And that's what caused Captain Fletcher's injuries. It was quite well documented at the time, and there were significant reports into the incident to try and understand what could be done. However, there was very little follow up or uh, conclusions uh, as a result of the incident. And if we just move on to the next one, the, the second significant precursor was that on the 17th of November in 1962, not long after the first one, four US Navy officers were injured in a crew equipment laboratory in Philadelphia. And this was testing pressure chambers at 3.5 uh, PSIA, 5 and 7, um, when there was an external spark. Uh, the test was conducted to understand the effects of breathing pure oxygen for 20 days at simulated high altitudes. And it was actually caused by a um, task of fixing a light bulb, um, which had the consequences of igniting the fire in the uh, pure oxygen state and seriously injured two members of the crew. And I think it's really important that these two incidents have many parallels to that of uh, the Apollo 1 uh, incident. And it's surprising that neither of them led to any further investigations into the use of pure oxygen. And that probably has something to do with the fact that it was used so many times um, in earlier uh, flights that it was just seen as that was the natural decision, the easiest decision and the cheapest decision to uh, implement. One aspect that um, come, uh, comes to light throughout uh, my research is that there were numerous areas where there were haphazard failings from NASA. And to understand the impact these have uh, on human safety is quite difficult, um, especially as a lot of them didn't necessarily have monumental uh, impacts, but it's just a sign of the weaknesses that um, were brought about due to the uh, time constraints and the focus on getting the job done. The uh, first one uh, that I uh, discovered uh, through interviews is the um, release of the Apollo spacesuit, which was uh, uh, created by um, the contractor Hamilton. When they brought out the spacesuits, which was obviously designed for the highest specification of human spaceflight to protect the astronauts, and it was going to be their eco chamber while uh, in space, um, it turns out that they weren't actually measured correctly and my, uh, none of the suits that had uh, been created could actually fit on the couch in the command module. The shoulders were too wide. And that's incredibly interesting because such an easy task such as measuring spacesuits should have been one of the first things done, but it wasn't and it was just a sign of some errors that were emerging throughout the, uh, the program and particularly with some of the contractors. We're going to look at Hamilton and um, the uh, AI research, which are responsible for uh, significant elements of the Apollo program in Block 1 and Block 2 construction. And um, we'll see later on how um, there was often communication and mismanagement issues between NASA themselves and some of the contract organizations. So we begin with the Torrance facility fire, which is one of the biggest uh, precursors that uh, there is to the Apollo 1 fire. And its conclusions to the fire are scarily similar to those of the Apollo 1 fire, which is phenomenal um, given the impact this had on uh, later uh, pure oxygen environment testing. 
and the facility was the research center of AI research, which was involved in creating the environmental control system. And this test was for production and qualification uh, of the ECS. And the altitude chamber that was being used uh, was to uh, simulate the interior environment of the command module. And it was being subjected to a 500 hour mission duration qualification test. The fire, which began on the 28th of April, 1966, which is almost a year to, um, uh, to the Apollo 1 fire, uh, was 480 hours within, uh, into the test when the fire erupted into the chamber. As a result, the ECS and the equipment bay was significantly damaged. And the North American Aviation subcontracted the testing to AI research, and uh, they had garnered a reputation for substandard workmanship. Um, consequently, uh, there was an independent uh, MCS board was convened on the 5th of May to investigate. And one of those members was Gary Johnson and astronaut Frank Borman. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to uh, be able to speak to Gary Johnson a lot about uh, this incident uh, due to how pivotal it was um, with the Apollo fire. Um, Similarly to the Apollo 1 investigation, there was a full teardown and examination of the command module and the uh, ECS and uh, preliminary inspection by both AI research and NAA. Um, and this was important because NASA hadn't um, been involved at the immediate cause. There was a slight delay, um, which is one telling of some sort of uh, communication issues which did crop up uh, now and again. And the issues with conducting um, tests across the whole of the United States and obviously the difficulty of uh, traveling um, uh, to reach the different locations for the investigations. So the consequence of this fire was that um, a major conclusion following the Apollo 1 fire was that we need to evaluate the flammability of command module components, um, which is concerning because this was the same conclusion that was reached with the previous investigation at the Torrance facility fire. So there's already numerous parallels being drawn towards both incidents. The preliminary recommendation by James E. Webb, the NASA administrator, um, was to decide the next steps of the program. And his main recommendation was that combustible materials now used uh, should be replaced wherever possible with non-flammable materials and that on the pad emergency procedures be advised to recognize the possibility of a cabin fire. However, all of these points were also in the Torrance facility report in 1966. So it does come to question how come these reports were never implemented. And fundamentally, it's often down to communication between organizations and the limitations of time and finan uh, finances available to implement these. Where my current dissertation uh, takes a new look is the issues with confidentiality and secrecy, as obviously this was during the Cold War and the space race was highly confidential, even though there was over 400,000 different individuals working on it, numerous companies. It was important that any errors were kept played down or focused around those individuals that could really respond to it. And when I was speaking to Johnson, um, uh, I was told that he was instructed to minimize the size of his original report and remove all the photographs, drawings, and anything else that would have made it quite, quite a lot more interesting. And this is something that comes up a lot of the time. And it's important to understand the different reasons why this was and the context of the Apollo missions as a whole. But it later brings up more questions as to why this wasn't done in later uh, missions where the importance of secrecy or the uh, conclusion of the Apollo program wasn't as important, which is something I'll talk about uh, in a bit. So the impact of the transfer uh, facility report establishes that the impact of the fire and a reevaluation of the program schedule. Before the fire, um, on the 17th of April, they'd used commercial grade heater tape, which was placed on a steam line exterior to the chamber. And it was believed that this overheated and the insulation failed. 
when he was uh, aware of the uh, earlier incident, he was told uh, to remove it from the report. And when speaking to the engineer in charge of the test, Johnson said that the technician had gone down to Sears and bought the heater tape. And obviously this is quite significant because the tapes that purchased from Sears or any sort of hardware store can't be used on something like um, a cool water line. And when you think about something so important as the environmental control system, which will be then implemented into the uh, Apollo command module in center space. So it does bring up questions of the um, role of contractors and some of the other organizations where some aspects of the um, engineering weren't fully aligned with the expectations of NASA and the US government, such as uh, introducing um, commercial uh, heater tape into such a highly specific and uh, impactful aspect of the, uh, of the uh, design. Just move uh, on to the next slide. We move on to chapter two of my dissertation, which looks at the role of uh, Dr. Floyd Thompson, who is appointed lead of the internal NASA investigation, the Apollo 204 Review Board. <coughs> One of the people I interviewed, Conley Perry, was a test engineer and he was tasked with replicating the Apollo 1 fire, testing both the command module and the lunar module. And um, as you can see on the left there is a, a flammability test run, which was uh, conducted uh, post Apollo 1 fire. And it's incredible some of the photos and uh, investigations that were conducted after the Apollo 1 investigation uh, to see how safety can be better um, implemented and uh, standards brought up to that necessary to keep crew and uh, staff safe. So I'm going to quickly talk about um, Dr. Floyd Thompson and um, bring up my uh, theory that I proposed in my dissertation, which is on the idea of informal and formal safety theory. Um, which looks at the different roles of people within NASA and within the contractors um, during the Apollo program. So Robert Siemens in his memorandum, which is dated 28th of January, 1967, just the, uh, the following day after the fire, uh, stated the uh, review board would compose their objectives. And uh, uh, Thompson, who's director of the Langley Research Center, authorized a probe on February 3rd. So again, there is a slight delay there between um, when uh, the official uh, investigations go on and the actual incident itself. Uh, this was composed of NASA government agency staff, consultants, liaison officers, and um, observers, administrative staff. And the most component factor that was first introduced was the spacecraft materials and they realized this would be a pivotal aspect of the investigation, which is a common theme throughout most of the fire-based investigations that they've had before, uh, a recurring factor throughout um, safety issues that they had at NASA. I'll just move on to the next slide. The determinations of the Apollo 2, uh, 204 Review Board, sorry, um, concluded that there's 11 major conclusions. <coughs> with the fundamental finding that there was a momentary power failure and there was uh, evidence as well of several um, arcs a uh, uh, very uh, close period to when the uh, power failure was um, noticed. Uh, the probable initiator of the electric arc was in the lower forward section of the left-hand equipment bay, um, which is coincidentally where the environmental control system instrumentation powering and wiring leads um, unit are all uh, focused on the oxygen panel all in this exact same area. Uh, what was also discovered was that in this area there's a significant amount of highly flammable materials and when you put two and two together lots of evidence put, uh, points to the environmental control system being at the source of the fire um, similar to the Torrance facility fire. If I just move on to the next slide. Now, this photo was uh, given to me by Gary Johnson. And what you can see there is the left hand side 
of the bay um, at the ECS unit there um, is just above the red arrow that you can see in the bottom left corner there. Now, in this position where the arrow is pointing is the Teflon wire bundles. And it's a bundle wiring that has a Teflon overwrap um, into the hardline plumbing on the floor there. The equipment by uh, bay behind uh, the clamp is where the ECS is housed, as I said earlier. <coughs> However, with the uh, inspection uh, following the Apollo 1 investigation, this Teflon strap had actually um, slipped and wasn't protecting the plumbing like it was intended to. Uh, this was uh, reported as uh, one of the possible causes of the fire. Uh, however, something that is exempt from the report was this was actually where Gus Grissom was sat, where his foot would have been placed is on top of the Teflon cover. And obviously it's, it's all complete speculation. However, it isn't um, sure or known if this was something that could have been caused by um, Grissom and it was left out of the investigation to protect him um, and his family as a result of the um, fire. And they didn't want any blame to be placed on him or any of the other astronauts if that meant they um, would come under fire and additional scrutiny. So significant changes came about as a result of this, uh, this find. And, um, the flooring, instead of being uh, protected like it was, um, had now um, been given metal hard covers. Uh, this meant that there was no exposed wiring and it couldn't be stepped on or moved. The, uh, before this, the floor protection was composed of foam pads and these weren't compatible with the 16 P, uh, PSI pure oxygen environment. It was actually discovered that the environmental pressure was three times higher than what the foam pads were qualified for, which again focuses a lot on the um, material side of the implementation uh, for the command module um, and how it wasn't considered to be a risk, or if it was considered to be a risk, it was one that was seen as a negligible risk. And as you can see, that, uh, with that, uh, that picture there is dated on the um, 2767, so it's not too long after the, uh, in, uh, the fire itself. So, a uh, pivotal aspect which uh, sort of undermines a lot of the uh, issues is that of time. And the standard engineering practice was that when there was five or more engineering change orders uh, issued against a drawing or design, um, a review and hazard analysis would be required. Um, this meant that the standard procedure, however, was abandoned uh, at the start of the Apollo program due to the difference of time and finances. Um, it could be argued that if the standard practice was implemented, that it would have known that too many wires were in fact passing through this Teflon wrap um, and the insulation used for the wiring tended to extrude when pressure was applied to it. And therefore, this uh, further uh, reduced the number of wires that could be held by the retention clamp and created a buildup of pressure on the insulation materials as it began to extrude. And this was believed to have shorted and ignited. Uh, <coughs> this could have been actually identified with an ECO uh, hazard analysis that the number of wires were too, uh, too many for what could have uh, coped within the clamp and um, all points to the Teflon wires being the source of ignition for the Apollo 1 fire. However, due to the state of the command module, it was never completely um, identified as the main source. However, much of my investigations have pointed to this being the, uh, the source of the ignition uh, more than any of the, of the uh, uh, suggested uh, ignition points. This also sort of goes back to the uh, block one and block two um, issues that they had. Um, the Torrance Facility Fire Report concluded that three months after the fire, 
AI research, uh, research started retesting the modified ECS with new block one and block two components. However, one con uh, conclusion from this was that the qualification testing was completed on February 28, 1967, seven months after the start of the test. But this also means that the Apollo 1 fire, which was on the 27th of January, um, hadn't had an ECS system that had passed its qualification testing, which is important with regards to the contextual findings of the 204 review board pointing towards the ECS as being a substantial factor in the fire. It also means that the ECS should have passed its qualification test before being used in any uh, substantial testings, which is also something which James Webb questioned himself uh, upon the discovery of, of this fact, saying that should we have ever flown the Block 1 spacecraft in the first place, since we know there are many deficiencies which we can only fix the Block 2. So that's an interesting aspect of um what could have done with relation to block one and block two and then particularly the uh, difference of time and how time is a substantial factor um placed on by um president kennedy to get the mission completed by the end of the decade and as we moved into january 27 1967 there's only three years left to accomplish this goal and time is of the essence so that is potentially one area where time should have been uh, taken to complete the testing to make sure that uh, all aspects of the um, uh, hardware were safe for, uh, for flight. I'm gonna move on to chapter three of my dissertation at the moment. And this looks at the external side of the um, uh, of the investigation, looking at the uh, Senate Committee on Aeronautical and Space Sciences Review, uh, which ran parallel to the NASA Review Board um, investigations. And there was two main lines of investigation uh, for the Senate. This was a study of the background data used to understand the accident and a series of hearings uh, from NASA and Review Board officials, as well as NAA contractors. Fundamental to this was the Phillips Report, which I'm not sure if anyone's heard about, but became significant publicly following the Apollo 1 fire. And this was a report written by General Samuel Phillips, who was director of NASA's manned lunar landing program between, um, in 1965 and 66, which is when he wrote the report. And it highlighted significant shortcomings in NAA scheduling, overmanning, engineering quality and efficiency. And the existence of the report uh, raised further questions uh, because it wasn't a publicly made report. So there was lots of questions as to why uh, wasn't this a, a public report and what did NASA do to ensure NAA, NAA was up to standard following this report. And these two questions really impact the trajectory of the Apollo program um, with the understanding that contractors were being used where it potentially wasn't best used. Now, the report surfaced as a result of Senator Walter Mondale and concluding settlement of the um, Senate committee report. Uh, Mondale highlighted the significance of the Phillips report during the hearings. And this still isn't actually how he got hold of this report, as it was completely secret from the public and only in um, the hands of NASA officials. However, uh, Mondale was concerned with the failures of NASA to inform Congress and the grave situation, which is quoted, that was unquestionably serious dereliction. Mondale argues that the NASA officials and contractors attempted to mislead the committee and evade questions, which is something that my uh, current dissertation is focusing on uh, significantly. And this is because the government and the uh, American public, the taxpayer who are funding the, uh, the program um, had a favorable uh, interest in the performance of NASA and to understand how the program was going. Uh, obviously, that comes uh, head to head with the secrecy and the issues you have surrounding uh, the Cold War and the Soviet threat at the same time. So it's really interesting to see how these two different uh, threats were both um, implemented and the consequence of that. And unfortunately, predominantly, it meant that secrecy was favored instead of 
um, any sort of public admission or coming forward with any issues that were had. And the Phillips report is really a key indicator of this with its uh, significant um, uh, examples of issues at NASA. Um, I'm just going to quickly talk about um, General uh, Samuel C. Phillips. And one of his um, big uh, supporters is um, an author called Jeffrey S. Bateman, who's uh, author of a very good book, actually, uh, The Ultimate Program Manager, um, General Samuel C. Phillips. And he argues that the Apollo 1 fire was completely unrelated to the problems highlighted in this Phillips report. However, a lot of my research has suggested that this isn't in fact correct. Uh, one of the conclusions of the Phillips report is that the uh, NAA quality was not up to the required standards. And um, he says, quote for quote, which is illustrated by the large number of correction EOs and manufacturing discrepancies. Uh, furthermore, the deficiencies is compounded by the large number of discrepancies that escape NAA inspectors, but are detect uh, detected by NASA inspectors. And likewise with the Apollo 204 review board, which highlighted deficiencies in command module design, workmanship and quality control. These corrections being referred to in the Phillips report are in the same highlighted, such as the Teflon wire retention plan for the Apollo 1 fire. I think that brings a very clear link between what was said in the Phillips report and the Torrance facility report in 1966 and the fire in 1967. Um, I believe that NASA thought it was critical to reduce the impact of these findings because it had a significant impact on their image and to ensure continued financial support from Congress and the public, which is something that is really, really important. And I'd just like to quickly speak about um, something Gary Johnson said to me, and uh, he commended the NAA management and other contractors involved as well, as they took the high ground uh, for a lot of the uh, backlash that they had a result of the investigations. Um, NASA blamed the majority of engineering safety shortcomings on the NAA, um, but they realized that if they were to continue their work, they'd have to take the blame and fulfill the program goals and fixing the issues as they came along. It uh, identified the limitations in NAA standards and engineering performance as well. And unfortunately, the criticisms of the Phillips report extended to every sector, including command module and the Saturn II management, looking at pricing, reliability, and manufacturing control. And the concluding statements that Phillips writes is, I could not find a substantial basis for confidence in future performance, which is a really telling statement and quite a shocking one to find when you think of the Apollo program in its general um, sort of historiography and background as being renowned, uh, renowned as something that had no issues and was the most confident and futuristic um, program there is. These sort of comments are quite surprising to find. However, when looking at the history of different issues, it's quite clear why they were being said. <coughs> Mondale was actually interviewed by um, Richard Paul, a writer and producer in 1999, called a, uh, for a series called Washington Goes to the Moon. It's a really interesting um, series that is still available now. And it highlighted the role of politics and the Apollo program and included uh, figures like uh, Walter Conkright and Robert Siemens, who was the NASA deputy administrator. And in the interview with Mondale, he um, recalls the criticism he faced by NASA and particularly James Webb. And he had a private uh, discussion with him following the second hearing. And Mondale states that Webb believed the report was a private matter and in deference to this, Mondo declared, I'm a United States Senator, this is public business. And this is really important to understand the mindset at NASA at this time, um, with James Webb believing something like the Apollo program was completely private and shouldn't involve the public and Congress is really interesting, especially as the fact that the significant difference between the Soviet and the United States um, programs was that the Soviet Union was a military program and NASA was fundamentally a 
public program. And with this role of being a public program, you have to decide how much the public should know. And at this point, I think it's quite fair to say that the public should have known more. But James Webb disagrees with this. And that's where the, the difficulties in secrecy and confidentiality, even more so within the Cold War, are uh, at odds with the public aspect of NASA and the program as a whole. Um, Funny enough, as a result of this statement as well and the, uh, the second hearing, there was significant um, national and newspaper um, responses. Um, a lot focusing on NASA's attempt to cover up problems in the space program. There's one on the uh, 23rd of March uh, by the Evening Star that headlined NASA's April Fool Report as it was uh, set to be released on April uh, Fool's Day, April 1st which um, was all, uh, went on to say that um, it, it described the investigation as shabby farce of NASA investigating NASA in the Apollo tragedy and how it was coming to a close. And then it goes on to say that Congress is preparing to take over and perhaps the truth will out, perhaps. And that's really interesting um, given that the importance of public support and financial backing and shows that following the fire there wasn't such support and it, it demonstrates how there is a necessity for NASA to become more public even in a time of the Cold War and such heightened tensions because they weren't getting the support they, they needed for financial backing not only from Congress but also from um, know that the American public um, however this takes many forms and obviously there was always fundamentally support for NASA even though they were hiding what was going on but it's important that their their investigations took a different form and a, di a different avenue so the final chapter that I'm going to look at which is mainly focused on my current uh, dissertation is confidentiality. Now this looks at the Apollo 11 uh, uh, re-entry into Earth's orbit. Now obviously there's uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins as everyone knows but as they were uh, coming into Earth's orbit, uh, orbit to, jet and to jettison away from the service module uh, as standard procedure um, would expect, they discovered that as they were coming back through, the service module was actually chasing the command module and the jettison had failed and that the uh, command module had uh, approached from behind. <coughs> This is sort of uh, a summary of, of what would happen, but Buzz Aldrin was the first to notice this. And the Apollo 11 crew reported the incident during the mission debrief. However, what's interesting is that the um, debrief did not occur until September 1969. And further to this, the debrief remained classified and access to the information was done on a critical need to know basis. However, what was also discovered was that Apollo 8 and Apollo 10 had experienced the exact same issues, but both of those missions failed to detect what had gone on. Now, this raises numerous questions because obviously by this point, Apollo 11 had achieved the goal set out by uh, JFK and the fundamental um, objective of reaching the man on, uh, putting a man on the moon and bringing him back safely. However, Apollo 12 was launched without the opportunity to fix this issue and the actual crew were made unaware of the risk and continued to launch until November 1969. So it's quite uh, an easy question to ask is what went wrong? And my research suggests that NASA risked the lives of the Apollo 12 crew knowing that the service module could have collided with the command module during re-entry. And there's even um, a photograph taken, uh, which unfortunately I haven't been able to source at the moment, of the service module uh, chasing the command module and uh, a sailor on um, 
one of the uh, aircraft carriers uh, took a picture of it as it was coming into Earth's orbit. But um, the only evidence that actually proves this was um, a preliminary redesign of the uh, Jettison Control, which was uh, signed by Johnson dated 10th of October 1969. But these changes weren't implemented until after Apollo 12. And the issue with the Jettison uh, Control turned out to be sequencing issues. Uh, the minor sex jets wouldn't fly until depletion, um, but it showed that the propellants were not being depleted at an equal rate with some jets firing longer than others, which caused tumbling and direction changes. This meant that the uh, consequence was that the um, service module, although it separated, would then turn around and chase uh, the command module coming through uh, Earth's orbit. The anomaly report uh, indicates the existence of the photo that I showed that I was talking about earlier, coming through the entry corridor. And instead of being in a highly elliptical orbit, uh, eliminating a risk of contact, it instead just chased the command module. And the report highlighted three conditions that might have caused this unexpected trajectory, which include large uh, initial separation uh, moments, reaction control hardware failure, and propellant dynamics during thrusting, which was the um, final determining cause. And the actual sloshing of the propellant within the vehicle made it become unstable, and this created a low separation velocity, uh, which meant that the uh, service module, instead of being Jetson's way, uh, only slightly separated, but continued its trajectory behind the uh, command module. So this brings me to my current uh, dissertation focus, which looks at safety, confidentiality, and secrecy. Now, a lot of this is based on the idea of the Apollo program and NASA being deemed a high reliability organization, which is where there is a expected risk due to the factors and complexity of the task is actually used uh, often with uh, nuclear uh, power plants, um, fires, as you can see in the um, references there, the Challenger disaster and the Columbia shuttle disasters. However, it isn't generally applied um, to Apollo. So this is quite um, a nuanced uh, perspective and uh, aspect to follow down. But it's very important to use this uh, model to understand how risks can be averted in such a high-risk organization. If I just move on to what the factors are that contribute to high reliability, high reliability organization decisions. Now, with NASA, these are really important, especially in times of the debates around how much public access there should be. With decision making, there comes five significant factors. The first is that of public opinion. And the second is the use of risk and dangers. The third is the finances and economic atmosphere. The fourth is the impact of time and delays. And the fifth is the political atmosphere. And obviously this all relates to the space race dynamics and the threat of the Soviet Union. And my fundamental conclusions is that the relationship between confidentiality and safety was contrasting and twined within such a specific socio-economic and political constraint that any sort of publicity and shortcomings in safety created unease and distrust by the American taxpayer and Congress who were financing the program. This meant that the consequence was that the immediate risks were often addressed to the minimum standards to avoid scrutiny from officials and meet requirements for successful mission completion. Delays and costs of addressing safety shortcomings were incompatible with the resources and timeline established by Kennedy and Congress. And the constant battles were consumed by the unknown advances of Soviet technology and space race. I'm gonna go back a, a little bit and actually talk about um, one of the uh, ideas that I come up with in my uh, research, and that is of informal and formal safety. And the fundamental differentiation in safety culture can be looked at between these two uh, different types of safety. Formal safety encompasses the safety departments and officials that are responsible for tasks such as component analysis, risk analysis, statistics, 
and informal safety is individual efforts that ensured mission success and as a consequence developed and encouraged safety and i've been able to speak to quite a few uh, nasa alumni league members um one name that uh, came up specifically was bill tyndall another one was george lowe and they were significant um informal safety pioneers uh, at nasa during the apollo program and they were fundamental for the apollo program being successful because they were ones that were pushing safety as a as a means to create a successful mission result if i um let's get out this one here. I was told by um, a few people actually that with the formal safety um, staff, a lot of them would run risk management calculations and give the chances, but they were often ignored and they were seen to be stiff armed a lot and um, uninvited to meetings and ignored but the informal safety pioneers were the ones that weren't making it clear that it was a safety issue, but they incorporated safety into every element of the task. And it's important because when you look at uh, cases, especially with formal safety, such as the Apollo program, a lot of the uh, production units were uh, military based before. And this meant that you had a numerous uh, amount of um, equipment being uh, created and tested, which means that when you're having um, statistical uh, reports being conducted on military equipment, um, the uh, accuracy is much higher because you have a lot more um, different tests being conducted. However, when you have an Apollo-based um, technology, which where they're only creating either block one or block two, there might not be many components involved. So predicting the um, risk element is a lot more difficult and you don't have the um, resources available to conduct it as, um, as uh, detailed as the military uh, testing uh, is. So it meant that they were often ignored and a lot of the calculations weren't actually implemented as they should have been. And just move on to this one. So it often suggests what's next. And further to the Apollo research, um, I was given this uh, document, and as you can see here, it's called a Pigonaut, um, Pig Astronaut. And um, this was a, a legitimate uh, actual drawing um, by NASA. Um, I'm not quite sure when it's dated, to be honest, but um, I, I know it's real. And this is sort of one um, of many different ideas propagated um, for uh, the program of how to do testing. And uh, if you didn't know um, much about pigs, if you lock a pig upside down like that, um, it won't be alive for very much longer, unfortunately, um, which is obviously a huge drawback, but one avenue that I think research will go on uh, to look at as different alternatives and where instances such as this with so much planning design and um, energy and efforts have gone into creating something like the, the pig astronaut where it's fundamentally flawed because a pig <coughs> couldn't survive in that sort of condition straight away. Um, and instances like that aren't uncommon. Uh, I'll, just go, um, I'll just quickly talk about my, my final dissertation points. Um, a lot of it was seen that confidentiality and risk were seen as necessary comings in the space race. And my thesis hopes to analyze these risks and see if they were necessary in such a climate. Um, I have, and I'll show you just some of the dissertation uh, questions that I hope to answer, just to sort of finish off on uh, my talk. Um, why was confidentiality used to secure public support? 
And this is looking at obviously the uh, distinct battle between should you let the public know what's going on if there are shortcomings, should they know? Or do you keep it quiet until the public find out and then see, receive backlash as a result of that? What impact did confidentiality have in leading to breaches in safety? If, for example, the Apollo 12 crew were harmed in any uh, such way, which fortunately they obviously weren't, would um, the issues with jettison control not being made public have damaged NASA beyond any sort of um, repair control? What was done to overcome confidentiality to promote a greater need for the implementation of safety culture? <coughs> and to compare and contrast the origins of safety shortcomings caused by incompetence and negligence compared to those caused by confidentiality, which is really important to um, distinguish between the risks that will be seen as a result of normal um, high reliability organisations and those that would cause as a result of confidentiality. So I'm just going to finish on there. I have uh, my email address is at the um, bottom of this um, uh, presentation slide here. Uh, Callum.hardy at kcl.ac.uk. Feel free for anyone to contact me if you uh, have anything you want to talk about. I'd be more than happy to uh, talk through and um, ask questions as well to understand different people's point of view and what they experience during their job. Uh, even if it isn't part of Apollo, it would be great to hear um, all the different avenues such as um, the Soyuz or International Space Station shuttles and that sort of thing. I think now we're going to go to a Q&A element. Um, I can see there's a few messages in the chat, so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen here. Okay, excellent, Callum. Boy, uh, you brought up some very, very good points. Yeah, and of course, safety has always been an issue uh, with, with NASA. You know, it's a very dangerous business that we're in, and of course, we've lost a few a few crewmen because of uh, negligence issues and it's something we, we dealt with and something that anyone doing any dangerous endeavor will always deal with. Uh, but while you were speaking, there were a lot of great comments on the chat board and I, I would like to encourage uh, to some of these discussions to be brought up with Callum. So uh, like, I know Bill Barry had a bunch of great comments. So uh, anyone have any questions for our comments for Callum? I can see one here. Um, it was... uh, this is Gary Johnson, Callum. It's good to see you. Uh, we've see conversed you. a lot by uh, uh, email and information and so forth. Uh, thanks for the presentation because uh, I've always been concerned about not getting the word out and this concern about concealing uh, uh, investigations and anomaly reports and so forth because at the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, I happened to be at the table with Charlie Duke who was on Apollo 16 and I mean, he was never even aware of because I mentioned to him there about the service module problem during Apollo 11. He was totally unaware of that. And then I went ahead and walked through it. I was involved in the changes. And we did make a change starting with Apollo 13. And uh, so there was a change made on his spacecraft as well. I was surprised that the astronauts themselves not being briefed, one, about the problem. and two, not even knowing that there had been a change made on their spacecraft uh, while they're on the way to the moon, because I thought, you know, that'd be one of the things. But I didn't know that till I was actually talking to Charlie Duke that uh, they were totally in the dark about that. It's actually quite uh, amazing how um, information was spread around NASA. Um, a lot of my research has suggested that even flight controllers weren't made aware of significant changes that were going on. And obviously you have issues like that in such huge organizations that the communication channels aren't always either up to date or um, as uh, succinct as one would hope um, for issues like that. 
Um, and it sort of brings uh, together as well differences in, I saw uh, one of the uh, points there was um, talking about um, uh, classified and uh, restricted. Um, and although the crews uh, had access to um, different elements, um, they weren't always the ones that needed the, the information. Um, uh, when speaking to a few people, um, they were doing tests and it was only like six or seven months later that they received information from uh, a previous issue that they realized it impacted all of their investigations. And looking at the Torrance facility report as well, it was so difficult even for me now to have um, access to the report. It wasn't something that you can easily bring up and that's 50, 60 years later. Um, the access to information is still very difficult when everything's been digitized and shared around. These reports were often kept um, quite um, hidden and uh, unaccessible. Do you feel this environment exists even today? Well, that's a really good question, actually. Um, the difference today is that although the finances are obviously even more significant than they are now with um, sort of the Artemis program, you've got SpaceX and Blue Dragon. There isn't the time constraints that there were before and there isn't the rush as the uh, Kennedy um, proclamation stated to reach any significant goals without, within um, the end of the decade. So I don't think these sort of uh, issues exist as much as they did before. But obviously, because these uh, organizations are worth hundreds of millions, if not billions of uh, dollars, secrecy is still an issue um, throughout the industry. And opening it up obviously uh, introduces uh, challenges with um, confidentiality of financial documentation, engineering, um, organizations don't want to share information that leads makes them leaders in their field. Um, but obviously it's important that fundamentally human life is, uh, is the number one aim to ensure that they're safe and people aren't injured or killed, um, especially with the Artemis project, which involves lots of different organizations, which is fundamentally where a lot of the issues begin, uh, is the communication between different groups and organizations there. Now, Stokes, I'd like to make a comment if, on uh, the amount of secrecy involved. I, I think that uh, that was not my opinion of at all uh, that uh, there was any uh, intent to keep anything uh, as a secrecy thing. Following this fire, uh, there we had a, I don't recall exactly how long, but a, a year or two uh, of intense uh, reevaluation of all the designs of the whole spacecraft because there were uh, a number of people that had design situations that uh, they were nervous about and uh, we formed a, uh, I think it was called a safety review board. And it was uh, set up with uh, astronaut, you mentioned his name a while ago, I can't remember, but uh, the, 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 the uh, location of this was at uh, Rockwell at Downey. Uh, and they, they actually went through just about every system on the spacecraft and, and welcomed with open arms anyone that had something that they thought was unsafe. But there was no secrecy uh, of anything. Now, the mentioning of uh, the service module chasing the command module, I mentioned early, earlier that I was involved in the detailed design of a lot of the inside equipment inside the command module. But after it got designed, my job uh, changed to uh, operations. And I was 
we we had a uh a, a one person assigned that was called the mission staff engineer for each mission and he had the responsibility of everything uh what uh on the mission he was supposed to be knowledgeable of and uh conversant with uh each person that was involved with the responsibility of it. And uh, I actually served as the assistant mission staff engineer on the Apollo 11 program. And I was subsequently assigned to Apollo 13. And I, no one ever mentioned to me that uh, the entry was uh, bothered by the uh, service module chasing the command module. And I, I, I think it was not because someone wanted to keep it a secret. It's just that in a, in a mission, uh, a program like the Apollo program, it's impossible for everybody to exchange information about everything that happens. There's too, too many things. Uh, so it, <coughs> uh, <I'm, coughs> excuse me. My job would have required me if that was actually a, a problem to uh, make sure it was corrected on Apollo 13, which I was responsible for. <clears throat> so I, I I think that I've I've heard more emphasis on. Uh, Secrecy. Uh, this this wasn't what happened. It, it was, as far as I could see, uh, everybody uh, exchanged information uh, uh, best they could uh, without anyone trying to keep anything secret. As far as the design group of. of uh, design and testing and the op operations. Uh, something was mentioned about the, uh, uh, you know, the flight plan was open uh, for everybody. Uh, you know, there was, it, was, it was not a secret at all. Uh, anyway, I just want to make that comment that I thought that uh, I, I, I didn't see any uh, intended secrecy involved in uh, anything. And I, I was in a position to have known if, if that uh, happened. I, I see Chet Vaughn uh, is uh, listening. Uh, some of the other people could probably, uh, I would expect them to uh, support that, that opinion. That's a really good point, actually, about the change following the fire, how um, complete testing and reruns were introduced. Um, one of the interesting things that um, I found out as well, um, for example, um, it's uh, with the Velcro, which was obviously quite prominent with holding the um, cabin uh, spaces in the <coughs> bottom sections there. Um, if the, the Velcro was only tested horizontally, and if they tested it uh, in a vertical position, it would have turned out that it was highly flammable. And this is something that they didn't know prior to the uh, Apollo 1 investigation, but after and as a result of the extended uh, testing uh, that you spoke about, um, it came to like how flammable it was. Um, with the secrecy aspect of it, um, the main thing that I'm looking for, and I think the issues that come are not so much the secrecy between engineers and officials such as yourselves, but more the secrecy between NASA and the public, how uh, incidents such as the mission debrief, um, nowadays, there's a lot more expectation that um, critical information, if there, if there is, for example, an issue with one of the SpaceX uh, rockets, 
the uh, reports and investigations are published quite quickly and quite openly, um, even as a private organization. So that sort of does question how much NASA should have been um, publicizing um, different aspects of the investigation when so much money was being um, brought into it. If you look, for example, with the Torrance facility uh, fire, the conclusions almost exactly match that of the Apollo 1 fire a year earlier. So that does sort of bring up questions, why were the conclusions of this fire not ever followed on? And the only reasons that I can find out from as a result of this is um, the fact that um, it just wasn't well known. People either kept it quiet or top NASA officials didn't share it as publicly. And the reason for doing that is obviously they didn't want NASA to look bad. And when they needed critical funding, such as uh, what was needed um, uh, every year by Congress, it was better to keep these things away from the public, uh, even though some will uh, suggest that um, these are uh, these are things that should be brought to uh, public view. I just totally object to that observation or opinion. I don't know. Uh, that's not that's not the way we worked at all. I, I worked for NASA for 21 years, and uh, we 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 spent a lot of time trying to to share information about. Uh, different parts of the spacecraft. Uh, I, I, I had, a, I had a, a top secret uh, clearance and uh, I'm <laughs> never, you know, we, I, there, there's something, I think you've been uh, getting the wrong idea. And I'm, I'm not uh, trying to be argumentative, I'm trying to help you because if I were you, I wouldn't want to report anything that was just as far from the truth as, as what I'm hearing during this meeting. And I'll be glad to uh, correspond with you uh, later, but I, I would recommend to you that before you uh, consider publishing something about some sort of secrecy, uh, uh, in the Apollo program that you get uh, uh, so, some documentation to get someone that really knows what happened at the time. I, I, wasn't, able, I wasn't able to, to, to keep track of everything that happened, but my, the particular jobs that I had uh, in, during the operations uh, were such that I, I I was responsible to talk to every subsystem manager, which we had 10 or 11 of them, about the systems that they designed. So I, I think the idea that there, we, we were trying to do anything in secret uh, among the engineers there from the top to the bottom is uh, over only stated. I'd be interested to speak to you after this, uh, just to see your different uh, viewpoints of uh, some of the, the uh, different things that have found out, maybe a, a different time to this, but uh, that'd be really interesting. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, Jim, uh, yeah, sure. you, Callum, you brought up, uh, I think, a firestorm, yeah, when you, you say, we we did things in secret because yeah, you got to remember we're just a bunch of people just like you. Yeah, you know, we we it's not uh, you know we're not trying to keep secrets. Uh, I think Jim brought up a good point. There's so much information, no one can know everything, and and just like let me the Columbia accident. Uh, uh, one problem with that is you know we had a thousands of people that worked on the, the space shuttle orbiter, another thousands of people that worked on the external tank, and thousands of people that worked on the solid rocket booster. And we're all 
compartmentalized into our particular piece of the pie. And so the, the Columbia accident happened because a piece of the external tank flew off and hit the, hit the orbiter. Well, there were not very many people who covered the integrated. You know, this was an integration issue. Uh, and that was kind of the failure of the, of the Columbia problem that uh, is, it, it wasn't <laughs> the integration issue. And so, uh, but I think like Jim said, it's just, the main thing is just the quantity of information. No, it's hard to get everything known by everybody. In a way, it's almost a piece of luck when, when something not related to your system comes into your knowledge. Yeah. And system integration is something like so, really so I, I'd like to. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So I, I'd like to make a couple of comments. I, I, I agree uh, with Jim with regard to the secrecy. I don't think it was there. And I was in the program all the way through the program. Uh, what I would ask you is, did you guys did, talk about the, the process that we had, which, which for every anomaly that we had, every failure that we had, had to be analyzed. Uh, it had to be approved. It had to go up through the total system. If it was a flight type issue, it had to be closed out before you could fly the next flight. We, we had, and that, that was true all the way up the line. Uh, now, did we, did we make some missteps along the way? Sure we did, but, but not very many. Uh, it, it would with the with the kind of total amount that we were dealing with, but if you if you're not familiar with that system, uh, you, you really ought to take a look and see how it worked, because because that really was the documentation of what was going on with every mission. I'd be surprised if you didn't look back and and find out if it was a little strange something had happened uh, on the on the uh, uh, command and service module separation and coming into entry, by the way, that wasn't an issue. It was just an observation. Uh, so, you know, it, 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 it would have probably been observed and it, well, maybe it wasn't, it wasn't even observed until much later, I think. But I don't think that was much of an issue. But if you take a look at the rest of what was going on, we had every failure that we had uh, it, we had to go through and understand root cause. I didn't hear you discuss root cause and what's going on. Uh, that's very important. It could, you could apply it to people too, maybe. Uh, but uh, certainly with the hardware and the software, if you didn't understand what was going on with it and you had an issue at all, and we were testing it all to, to, the, to basically the limits that we need to be flying to, and if we had an issue, we had to get it squared away before we could fly. And we, and we cleared them off and, and got them. And if we didn't have them, we, we wouldn't fly. We, we'd leave the mission on the ground for a little while. Uh, so I'm going to change subjects one more, and then I'm going to get off. Uh, the issue with the oxygen in the 60s and the operation with pure oxygen was near nil. We just didn't understand very much in the country, and I, I would suggest in the world, associated with high pressure oxygen, or in the, well, with oxygen, period, and, and with low pressure oxygen specifically, and, a, and, and also specifically with 100% oxygen. Everybody's very familiar with oxygen because you know, we breathe it all the time. But at this concentration, it's not, not a very big deal. If you, if you walk close to uh, a pure oxygen uh, duo that, that might have a cryogenics in it and might have a little extra oxygen in the air, and it, it used to be that people spoke. You know, I saw a guy walk up a little too close to one one time, the cigarette burned his lips before he could get it out of his mouth. <laughs> and, and, and that happened, and he wasn't close to the duo. Uh, he was just close to a high en enriched area. And when you go to that higher one, I know that there were in, in, in terms of the oxygen fire, the fire that we had in the, in the command service, command module, uh, the, there were like three incidents, incidents in the country 
that happened fairly close together. There was a Brooks fire, a fire at Brooks uh, in in uh, Santon, and I think Pelahoma was the other one, and the in the uh, the uh, command module was the third one that I would have been talking about. All of those were in pretty close succession, and we learned a lot about it. Did we learn enough? No, because we still had oxygen problems as we came on up uh, with uh, with other systems, and particularly now with higher pressure. Am I busting your ears? So, so anyway, there, 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 I don't think that there was any secrecy <laughs> in, in, in involved with this with the uh, with the systems and with the people is always a communication issue and somebody that maybe really needed to know didn't get the message sometimes and that was certainly true but it wasn't intentional uh, so I, I I would agree with that and I think that, that if you want to have a successful program be sure you understand the hardware number number one have good hardware and number two uh, understand it and, and, and operate it correctly Peace. Good, good brief. It's a, you, you get out, you get out, you get out adrenaline going a little bit. So thank you. Go. Like to take it up a notch. Um, first, um, sort of a defensive remark. We were a very young organization, very young, and we were trying to accomplish something that nobody else had ever even attempted. I was in the flight crew ops world. In the flight crew ops world, we lived and breathed what was going on with the crew. That was our mission, to make them successful, make the mission successful. But, it, but a lot of it was ad hoc. We made it up as we went. We had to. We put all the technical, we had a bunch of technical people that were coming from various organizations, from the old NACA to industry across the board, to, to uh, academia. We had all kinds of people. We were working with a green set of contractors. In our area, we had to deal a lot with flight software, which was being built by MIT. MIT was a research organization. They were having to learn how to build the software. We had NASA folks from various disciplines there to, while working with them. We worked on that, looked at the code at that level. It was an ad hoc operation. Now, later on, shuttle would begin to put in place a lot of different systems of one sort or another. Control system. Configuration control systems. We, I don't remember having a configuration control system in Apollo, but I sure remember having them in show because I helped set them up. So, you know, we're all a little defensive, I think. But we let's try to talk about it more from a higher level in the sense that we were a young organization. We had a lot of maturing to do. And the people that worked on the systems that things blew up and things like that. Our systems, you know, we were looking, we were looking at the processes, the procedures, flight crew procedures, that kind of thing. The people were building hardware, they were going through the same thing, except they had fatal mistakes. Luckily, we had no flight software problems that I know of that created a certainly not a disaster or even much of a hiccup. We put in, in, in simulators, we tested all the way through the, through the mission simulators and integrated sims and tested and tested and tested and tested hours and hours and wrung out some of those software problems, including the control center. But the people in the other areas were working the hardware and we weren't looking at them, we were looking over them. There, there really wasn't much of a, of a reliability control system that I know that they were dealing with. And they were dealing with liquid oxygen, right? New materials, on and on and on. So I think a lot of what we're talking about here is the lack of maturity in the organization. And the other aspect of it is, if you look at, and this is a hotspot, 
if you look at what happened on Saturn and what happened on the command module, I recently read the biography of von Braun, which is very interesting, by the way. There's another book about the rocket in the Reich when they first developed the rockets they fired at, at London, which is, you know, tough stuff. They were grown as an organization. They started there and they had years to develop what they wound up doing very successfully in the American rocket program and turned it around. And Saturn itself was almost a total success. They did have a problem with this too. The upper stage, it was another North American product. And they had a lot of, a lot of problems with it and they worked it, they knew how to work it. And they helped us later, even in the command module program. And that was a tough match, let me tell you. Two different organizations, two different backgrounds, different kind of management. Ultimately, it did work. But if you look at it from a higher level organizational thing, how do you develop a high reliable, high, what do you call it, HRO? Yeah. How do you build that kind of organization and which ones have been truly successful and what are the lessons learned that come out of it? Yeah, that's really important. Organizations yeah. that are not so successful at certain points in time, whatever the reason, with those that are more successful and coming up with an approach or a way to go about building these kinds of systems and making them work. Yeah, those are two really good points. Maybe academically they're doing it. I don't know. But I would hope that maybe that may be something you might be interested in. Thank well, you. To address your first point um, quickly, it's obviously really important to understand how important the Apollo missions were to human spaceflight. And obviously, I think the average age of um, a NASA employee at that time was 23 or something like that. So obviously, you're completely right there. It's very early days. It's people who don't have that much experience because the experience didn't exist. Obviously, you have Mercury and Gemini before that and some uh, pure oxygen related um, content for that and a sort of history there. But obviously going to space and this monumental achievement is fundamentally completely unprecedented and a phenomenal achievement um, that couldn't arguably be done in any other sort of climate other than the one at the time with the race, the space race and the finances available there. Um, that also sort of goes on to a lot of the research now into human spaceflight tends to look at the shuttle missions as the sort of pivotal start of any sort of issue. Um, they, the issue is, however, it sort of tends to neglect anything earlier than that. There's always a significant shift, like the Apollo Soyuz missions are always never written in significant sort of historiography there. They tend to be ignored. And it's important to look at every incident and um, fatality, more importantly, to understand those lessons, as you said, learn even more so in such a young organization. And um, I'm glad you uh, brought up uh, Von Braun, actually, um, because obviously, as you said, they had um, a brilliant uh, rocket engineer, but he had the finances and the legacy, obviously, from um, in the period during the Second World War. Um, and there was a, a different climate and a different sort of uh, expectation of um, him and him as an organization. Um, and I think those, uh, again, looking at them at different sort of um, climates with obviously the Second World War and then the Cold War and today, and sort of pulling out all of the um, bits that you, you really need to get, such as communication, as, as you've said, and um, those sort of different aspects to make sure that for the future, which is obviously the most important thing that uh, all elements of um, that can be um, uh, incorporated uh, can push forward and channel a, a truly safe realm of uh, human spaceflight. Um, SpaceX is an example of, of you know how successful they're really going to be in, in the long term. There's a book coming out by Larry Garber, and I can't remember the expansion of gravity or something like that. Anyway, uh, it's coming out in June. 
and I'm anxious to read it. I have not read it. I have done not recommend it. But, um, you know, if they're as successful, <laughs> I'd like to know why, you know, how come they were successful so quickly? You know, it's just crazy that that's happening. So, you know, it's, uh, so that's another aspect of, of the whole thing, you know, because it seems like they're, they're programmatic things and engineering is minimal compared to what we tried to do. So anyway, um, okay, I'll let you go, go ahead. Well, they're successful, but they, they're blowing up a lot of rockets. They what? Sorry? They're blowing up a lot of rockets. Yeah. To be successful, so, that's the way it is. Hopefully none of them have crews on. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. You know, but these then, failures get very personal with some of us because we've seen astronauts die. Yeah. Um, I work closely with Elliot C. in training and that kind of thing. And, you know, he was a great guy. I think he was one of the best astronauts I ever worked with. And I was in St. Louis when he was killed. So, you know, it, it gets personal. What could we have done to have prevented that when it's a T-38 accident in St. Louis? <laughs> and consequently, we started doing more simulation in Houston where they didn't have to travel so much. Now that sounds stupid, but that's what we did. So anyway, uh, all those things are kind of come into play in, in the way we react to some of these questions. Anyway. Yeah, I'd like to make one more uh, comment uh, related to that. Uh, even the guys uh, that weren't involved in operations and, and uh, flight plans and things like that, we were very close to the astronauts. We felt like that we were designing and building something for our big brother, uh, you know, and uh, the, uh, it, it was just a very close relationship. Uh, we, we had, uh, we'd normally have maybe a, an astronaut come sit down in, uh, in one of our structural design uh, uh, meetings. And uh, right. they, they wanted to keep they, These guys were all flight, uh, uh, flight test pilots. And uh, they were used to working with engineers uh, on a hand-in-hand -hand basis. So that, that was a wonderful relationship we got to know these guys very personally and uh we we had no reason to keep any secrets from anybody yeah and uh, i knew flight test pilots back in boeing when i first started the industry in 1958 and i could never get over what they would do that nobody in their right mind you'd think would do we had a test where we had lost the vertical stabilizer from the kc-135 and the astronauts took, were testing this thing and we were having them, had a fix we were putting in, improvement in some kind of actuator. Anyway, we started doing these testing, kick the rudder this way, kick the rudder that way, blah, blah, blah. You begin to see the oscillation of that, of that stabilizer. And finally we said, you know, I think we've taken this far enough. And he said, you sure? It seemed like me, we could do it one more. <laughs> so anyway. And that was in 1958, and those are the kind of people we worked with in Apollo, and in, in, in all the shuttle programs. Shuttle now is another ball game. Some of that seems, to, uh, when you look back on it, it seems like it's just pure stupidity on Challenger. Columbia, that thing got dinged on for many thousands of miles, many thousand, many missions. The tiles fell off that thing, and they kept track of it. They kept the data on it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then they didn't know what it had knocked a hole in the front, uh, front panel of the wing. It was a surprise. I think contingency planning got lost there somewhere. We just got it custom. So anyway, there's been reports written on all that and we won't go into that. But anyway, uh, you know, I'm hogging the floor. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Right, thank you. Oh. So I'd like to I'd like to make one one other question uh, one other comment rather excuse me not a question 
the mindset in the early days and with the contractors as well as the industry side, uh, all and up and down the line in terms of engineering through through uh, the design engineering through uh, manufacturing engineering and all the way up and down the line. I'd like to let you know of a, of a quote that my boss was was often said when when he saw he was out at a visiting a uh, at one of the major contractors uh, subcontractors uh, he they were out in the shop and a, and a guy came up with a little small rocket engine I dealt with small rocket engines not the big ones but uh, and and he said oops I, I got to go 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 get this one taken care of he saw him take it out of the the uh, the uh, machine that he had it in and operating on it and and, uh, he, and my boss asked him, well, what's wrong with it? He said, well, I think I missed this dimension. He says, if I go further on it, you know, I might get away with it, but it won't be right. He, he says, I know what this hardware is doing, going to do. It's going to be flying men to the, to the moon. And I want it to be exactly right. And I think we had that mindset throughout a large portion of all of the, the design people and, and development. And, and the follow through. The people who knew, knew Don Arabian, and I think Don passed away just recently, uh, last year or two, few years. And, and Don, Don, would, Don was the guy that landed the airplane, his personal airplane at the Laporte, with the gear up. And he said to them, the alarm was so loud I couldn't think. So he landed it with, with the gear up. So we scrubbed along the airport, but we laughed at Don. But Don would work and make you work until you understood your system and exactly what happened to it. And if he couldn't explain it to Don, you didn't know it yet. And so that was kind of the mindset that, that uh, we had through a lot of people uh, on the program. I'm working on Apollo hardware, a lot of people to the moon. I don't want my system to not do its job. And and that uh, and I and, and the, I think the integration group, to a large extent, did the same thing. We did minimize by design the amount of integration we had to do. Uh, the MSC people, the JSC people, could do the command service module, lunar module, maybe the Marshall guys could do theirs. But we didn't have too many interfaces between. I think there were like 20 interfaces between the Saturn V and and the command service module. Uh, on shuttle, um, excuse me, on space station, you can't have a single piece of hardware up there that doesn't interface with everything else. So, you know, keeping it simple that way also helps this distribution of of understanding and keeping the hardware uh, safe and doing its job. I mean, you could be safe on the ground, but you, you, you know, if you, so, peace. That's, a, that's another element is the integrity of the people in the system. Now that's a soft thing, but it's critical. You have to have people that are willing to admit that they made a mistake and come forward and say so. It's too easy to sit back and say, not my fault. You have to have a, an organization that is willing to accept people that have made mistakes, <laughs> willing to admit it. And they need to know that they have that freedom. Well, that's a good point. The people that get fired at NASA are the ones that keep it secret. Everyone makes mistakes, and we all we all realize that. But at NASA, you have to admit your mistake. If you try and hide it, that's when you get fired. I think that comes back to your comments about HR HROs. Do you have that in your analysis? That kind of thing is part of the success of an HRO. Um, not yet. That's something I'm following up on at the moment. It's, um, it's quite difficult, actually, to get hold of any of I'm those sure organizations. I'm sure it is. Yeah. Um, especially relating to any sort of um, analysis of, uh, as you said, with firing people. Um, I spoke to one person that said that there was a tendency to um, move people to different organizations at certain periods within certain subcontractors as well. Um, but it's really difficult to actually follow without speaking to them. So one of the things, especially that has uh, helped me today with this sort of thing, has been able to speak 
to different people because obviously NASA is such a huge organization. Lots of people have different experiences within different organizations and different groups and on different projects. So to hear everyone's different sort of viewpoints is um, really interesting and, and something that you don't get from other projects. Um, so as SpaceX, their employees tend to be quite quiet publicly, um, especially on an international stage uh, over here in, in Britain, we don't tend to get much information on SpaceX. Um, but that might be a different case in the uh, United States, but it's even more difficult to sort of um, see sort of discrepancies and that sort of thing where with like hiring and firing. How can we track your work? How can you track? Um, funny, uh, I can email over my uh, previous dissertation, but I will share uh, once I've completed this one, um, I'll email um, either Greg and uh, Stokes and um, okay. share that with everyone. Yeah. Great. Yeah, email me that and, and we'll get it. It, it. With your permission, we can put it on our, our website to go along with this presentation. And yeah, that's not people. Yeah. Like, okay. Uh, Stokes, I got one quick last uh, comment to make. Uh, <clears throat> the, the thing that I talked about, about uh, no one had secrets, was basically uh, on the Apollo lunar missions. Uh, later on uh, in the um, shuttle program, uh, my job was. Uh, the flight test requirements for the first six shuttle flights. And I had to go around and talk to each subsystem manager, uh, not only at JSC, which was just responsible for the orbiter, I had to make sure that all the test requirements were documented uh, with a uh, specification of the instrumentation that was required for the flight, as well as how you're going to get the data handled, as well as the uh, the post flight analysis of anything that needed to be tested, and uh, I'll never forget. Uh, I called up uh, the Marshall engineer that was responsible for the flight test requirements for the. Uh, the boosters, the SRBs. And uh, I said, uh, you know, I told him what I was doing and asked him uh, about his flat test requirements. And uh, he says, well, we don't have any. And I says, don't have any? I says, everybody's got a, a few. Are you sure you don't have a few test requirements? He says, nope, we don't have any. So, you know, that was, uh, I had to take his word for it. He was responsible uh, for the test requirements. So later on, after uh, we, we had the explosion uh, of, the, of the first one there, uh, I got, uh, I think I'd already retired from NASA at that point, but uh, I, I looked looked into it and I found out that the uh, the O ring that failed had uh, they had a lot of evidence uh, of 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 the earlier flights and even the ground test that they ran on those O rings that showed that they were getting uh, burn crews, you know. The, the O-rings were typically uh, redundant. There were two of them, and uh, they were they were they had situations where the uh, heat was causing a burn through of one of the O-rings. Uh, if I had known about that at that time, I would have made sure that it didn't happen. But I, I, I have no way of knowing what Marshall was doing uh, and what they were talking about. 
And uh, that was that was the secret that should have been. All he had to do was say, "Well, we'd like to put in a, a test requirement to evaluate the O-rings after each flight of the boosters." We we would that would have totally prevented what happened because we that design would not have not have flown and it was they had uh, to have some kind of test requirements yeah yeah well he the son of a bitch lied to me and, and I, i'll tell you that you know yeah like the russians and no documentation yeah well i've, I've actually studied that and uh, there were several cases of that it's called you know blow by where it blew by uh, yeah. The hot gas blew by an, an O ring seal. And that happened, I mean, more than once or twice or three times. They had that. But, but it uh, happened every flight. Is, yes, on different flights and different tests. But the thing is, nothing bad ever came out of it. And so Marshall decided, you know, they weren't keeping it a secret. They just thought it wasn't a big problem. Yeah. You know, and, and that's called uh, calibre. If you ever heard the, the term in family? an in-family malfunction is yeah. you know, where you see malfunctions, but nothing nothing bad happened. So it's okay to, to fl keep flying with it. Well, that, 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 that it's kind was, of like debris to, off the shuttle. Go ahead. That, that was why uh, we established the uh, flight test requirements uh, documentation was to make sure that every everyone that had a little problem could get some instrumentation set up or whatever post-flight inspections or whatever uh and uh that uh i wish i could have certainly you know, i wish i could have done more to find out but so uh, so so jim let me let me add something to it. it it would have been nice to know that and know it in advance uh, mm -hmm. but but if you look at it from the marshall standpoint uh that hardware would do its job it it did damage to the orbiter and 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 made it fail but it it would have gotten you all the way to orbit uh and you may have had a, a, a board from there if you if the leak had been at a different location so the question would Marshall guys is, hey, how much leakage should you allow? And the answer absolutely would have been, should have been zero, but that's not where they were. You're exactly mm -hmm. right. I, uh, o rings is something I specialized, uh, that, uh, that I got a lot of experience with during, during uh, before NASA and, uh, if I'd have known about it, yeah. I, if I'd have known that they had had a single fight with a blow by of a, of a single O ring, we would have had a, a serious test program that that would have uh, ruled ruled out flying with the O rings like that. Well, the contractor had the data too, right? Yeah. But see, I was in level two. But, but you didn't have right. You didn't have the data from the contract. Yeah. That's Roger Bojolet is the one that tried to bring it up, and he effectively got fa fired for it almost, I think. Yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, it's late over in London, so I'm. Yeah, I'm past your bedtime. <laughs> it's been wonderful. I'll tell you, the whole program was wonderful. We all have to. Have Thanks, to guys. I, I actually really enjoyed this. Uh, and Good luck. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be glad to help anybody uh, out that uh, has further work to do on this. Well, I would advise you, you guys that you know work on the program to to contact Caliper. Just give you know he you know he doesn't know your email address, but you you know his. Right. And contact him and tell him you'll answer any questions or or or, or whatever help he needs. Good suggestion. Alan, you want to give him your email address one more time? Yeah, I'll Good. just put it in the group chat there uh, on the chat bar at the bottom. It should just have come up. Put it where? It, it's on the chat at the bottom.
Callum dot Hardy. Oops, I lost it. Yeah, Callum dot Hardy at KCL dot C dot UK. Put put it in an email. Do that, dude. Okay. Anyone that wants to send me an email, I'm a uh, I'm Jim at SeaDiver.com. Jim, J-I-M at SeaDiver, S-E-A-D-I-V-E-R.com. I've got that written down as well. Mine's nothing at gmail.com. Say that again. Art Nolting at gmail.com. Art no n o l t i n g yeah it's on my screen all one word okay together no 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 space no dot to start noting together gmail.com Well, that one as well thank you very much for those thank you okay well callum thank you very much for a, a really outstanding program I, I think this generated a lot of great discussion and uh and it, we, we had more than the usual number of participants. So uh, it shows the interest in your talk. Well, thank you so, for having me. Yeah, Bill, Bill MacArthur, our president, he had to go off, but he said he asked me to give you his regards and thanks for, for doing this too. It's uh, really, we, we appreciate your time and, and your devotion to the American Space Program. It doesn't hurt at all for a lot of people to get in there and get involved and, and try and improve it. Yeah, that's the main thing, making sure that there's some sort of progress in the future and get as much attention on the amazing work that all of you have done and contributed to as well. Um, so thank you for all for your questions in Perts and, and being here as well. Well, and one of the participants was a guy named John Uri, U-R-I. He's the head historian at NASA at Johnson Space Center. So uh, maybe you'll be the head historian at ESA someday. Yeah, funny enough, uh, uh, there's been uh, lots of jobs actually for the uh, UK Space Agency come up, but uh, they're far too technical for uh, what I'm qualified for. Uh, um, that's always a, a, an interesting route uh, to go down for. Well, best of luck to you in, in your future endeavors. I think Thank we're, we're all be rooting for you. Thank you. Oh, okay, and so everyone, uh, let me. Our next uh, first Thursday program will be uh, in a month on May fifth, and there we're going to have a speaker from the Orion Project Office. Uh, he will give us an up. We, we're not sure who it is yet, but he, they will give us an update on the upcoming Artemis One mission. You know, the mission that'll be launched in a month or two or three uh, by NASA to, that'll circle the moon and, and come back to earth no, without without a crew but we'll get a, an update on that that should be a really interesting program so uh, david you can uh, stop the recording now